and so was Elizabeth. Her father's will had left her rich, and her place in the line of the succession made her a tempting target. One man in particular, Thomas Seymour, had his eyes on her. The Seymour brothers, as uncles to the young king, were the most powerful family in the land. Thomas, the younger brother, was bitterly jealous of his elder brother, Edward, because Edward had made himself Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector. Edward built Berry Pomeroy Castle in Devon. It's still owned by his descendant, John Seymour. Thomas, I think, was a, a wonderfully flamboyant and colourful character. Like his brother, he was very ambitious. And he took the most of the opportunities that were presented to him. Um, he was headstrong, I think. He probably didn't think a great deal about um, what was going to happen as a result of his actions. But he, he was undoubtedly out to favour himself and make the most of his opportunities in his life, which he did. Thomas plotted his advancement to power from his base at Sewdley Castle in Gloucestershire. His first idea was to marry one of Henry VIII's daughters. Either Mary or Elizabeth would have done. But the council vetoed that idea. So Seymour went for the next best thing and proposed to Henry's widow, Catherine Parr. Catherine had already been passionately in love with him even before she married Henry, so she accepted him like a shot. Elizabeth was living with Catherine, so this meant that Seymour wasn't only her stepfather, he was also her guardian. It was a position of trust, which he abused shockingly. At first, Catherine Parr's involvement made Seymour's game seem innocent enough. Elizabeth found Seymour an intriguing playmate. He was 40, and she was just 14. Seymour saw a relationship with Elizabeth as a means of drawing closer to the throne. His game grew darker. Catherine Parr was deceived by these antics, but Cat Ashley was worried. He romped with her in the garden and cut her gown into a hundred pieces. Seymour now got hold of the key to Elizabeth's bedroom. He would come into her room, partly dressed, early in the morning. Sometimes he would tickle her and slap her buttocks. Elizabeth was confused by Seymour's behaviour and by her reaction to it. Seymour was a handsome, sexually charged man, and she was flattered by his attentions, but she was also scared by them. So sometimes she behaved as though it was all a game and play hide and seek behind the curtains of the bed. On other occasions, though, Elizabeth would react as though her maidenly modesty had been outraged. She'd get up early and make sure that she was dressed so as to avoid Seymour's attentions. On the other hand, Cat Ashley, Elizabeth's governess, knew exactly what was going on. But when she reproved Seymour for risking Elizabeth's reputation, 
He brazened it out. He had no intention of stopping his behaviour, he said, because he meant no harm by it. But when Catherine Parr became pregnant, Seymour's flirtation with Elizabeth grew more serious. At first, Catherine could not believe what was happening. Finally, she was left in no doubt. My lord. Your grace. Following a painful interview, during which Elizabeth hardly spoke, her stepmother sent her away. It was the last time Elizabeth saw Catherine. When she moved to Sudley to have the baby, Elizabeth wrote to her, wishing her luck. But Catherine died shortly after the birth of her child, and she was buried here at Sudley. In her final delirium, all her fears and jealousies about Seymour's behaviour had revived, with very good reason, because Seymour soon renewed his suit to marry Elizabeth, and this time he had the powerful backing of Cat Ashley. Elizabeth herself, too, was enthusiastic, but she had the good sense to say firmly that she wouldn't consider the marriage without the backing of the council. Seymour, for his part, hot-headed and impetuous as usual, was too impatient to wait. Thomas was becoming more and more keen to attain some personal power and to further his career, and one way of doing this was to get Edward, the king, the young king, completely on his side. And I think he decided that he was going to actually abduct the king. And as he lived in the neighboring apartment, it was very easy for him to have conversations and meetings with the young king. And how it happened, I don't think is really clear, but we do know that he was found in the king's apartment with a sword in his hand. The spaniel, one of the many spaniels, I think, that, that the young king had, um, started to bark. And I suppose in desperation, Thomas ran it through with his sword. And there was a great kerfuffle and noise. And uh, people burst in, and Thomas was arrested. Seymour was charged with treason. His relationship with Elizabeth made her a suspect, too. A team of interrogators descended on Hatfield to discover whether she'd been plotting with him. Her closest confidant, Cat Ashley, was arrested and taken to the tower. Under threat of torture, she described the scandalous events of the previous summer. Her evidence was now used word for word against Elizabeth. Another time at Hanworth, he romped with her in the garden. Romped and cut her gown, being black cloth, into a hundred pieces. And when I came and chid Lady Elizabeth, she assured me she could not strive with all, for the Queen held her while the Lord Admiral cut the dress. The Queen, suspecting the often access of the Admiral to the Lady Elizabeth, came suddenly upon them, where they were all alone, he having her in his arms. Despite the evidence, Elizabeth refused to admit any wrongdoing. Then a rumour began that she was pregnant by Seymour. She complained bitterly to Somerset. Master Turwit and others have told me that there goeth rumours abroad that I am in the tower and with child by my Lord Admiral. These are shameful slanders. I shall most heartily desire, Your Lordship, that I may come to the court, that I may show myself as I am. Tyrwhit told Somerset he was sure she was guilty, but he could prove nothing. Elizabeth had survived the crisis. But Seymour's guilt was clear. 
In March 1549, Somerset signed his brother's death warrant and Seymour was beheaded on Tower Hill. Elizabeth's brush with Thomas Seymour marked a turning point in her young life. It was a brutal initiation into the world of adult politics and adult sexuality. She'd learned the hard way that a sexual relationship, even a close friendship, might mean danger, perhaps death. She knew now that when a man approached her, he got his eyes on the throne as much as on her. From this point onwards, she trusted almost nobody. She kept her own counsel and she concealed her true thoughts. It was her defense against a hostile world. <laughs>